Hello, and welcome to today's event. My name is Michel Hawks, and I'm the director of the Liu Institute for Asia and Asian Studies here at the University of Notre Dame. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's event, which is part of our research cluster on justice and Asia. The cluster on justice and Asia was established in 2018 with strong input from many of our Institute's faculty fellows who feel affinity with this theme and are eager to explore it across disciplinary boundaries. Each year, the cluster funds research projects in which faculty, graduate, and undergraduate students work together in engaging aspects of justice in relation to Asia. So far, we have funded three major projects one on environmental justice and resilience following the Fukushima earthquake, one on restorative and transitional justice in relation to Korean comfort women, and most recently, the project on theater and justice in Asia, led by professors Anton Huan and Terin Chan, which is the context for today's event. And here to introduce, here to introduce our speaker today is one of the leaders of the project, Professor Terin Chan. Professor Chen, over to you. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you to the staff at the Leo Institute, both for their support of this project and for hosting today's talk. Uh, my name is Taryn Chen. I'm assistant professor in the Department of Film, Television, and Theater here at Notre Dame. Um, together with my colleague, Dr. Anton Huan, who is professor in FTT and a celebrated director and playwright, we are helming the new project that Professor Hawks mentioned on theaters for justice in Asia, which brings together the scholarly and the creative to examine how artists in Asia use theater and performance to address the issue of social justice. It is my great honor and pleasure today to introduce Dr. Rosella Ferrari, who is professor of China studies, Chinese studies in the Department of East Asian Studies at the University of Vienna. Professor Ferrari is one of the world's leading experts on the performance cultures of the contemporary Chinese speaking world. Across her impressive body of work, she has been consistently committed to understanding the complex ways in which contemporary Chinese theater and performance often occupies and explores a transitive position, mediating between avant-garde and popular aesthetics, among transnational histories and collaborations, and within grassroots networks constructed in complex relation to nation and international systems of power, histories of trauma, and artistic traditions. Many of the current theoretical frameworks and essential key words for understanding contemporary Chinese theater come from her work, which includes books such as Pop Goes the Avant-Garde, Experimental Theater in China, Contemporary China, which was published in 2012, Transnational Chinese Theaters, Intercultural Performance Networks in East Asia, published in 2020, and Asian Cities Crossings, Pathways of Performance through Hong Kong and Singapore, co-edited with Dr. Ashley Thorpe of Royal Holloway University of London and published this year in 2021. Other topics on which Dr. Ferrari has published or is conducting research include the notion of Asian theater at, as method, which aims to destabilize Western centered approaches to intercultural analysis, the concept of Shichu 2.0, or how classical performance genres interact with new technologies and techniques, strategies of intertextuality and adaptation among Chinese, Asian, and other performance cultures, and a new project of performing post socialism in mainland China. Dr. Ferrari's research, especially her recent publications on grassroots theater networks in East Asia, speak deeply to the work on theater and social justice that Professor Juan and I are currently conducting. We are therefore thrilled to welcome her today and thank you all so much for joining us for what I'm sure will be an enlightening talk. I will now turn the floor over to Dr. Ferrari, but invite you all to stay after the talk for a moderated discussion and the opportunity to ask questions during the Q&A on Zoom. Thank you, uh, Professor Chan, for this uh, wonderful introduction and summary of my work. And thank you, especially for inviting me. I would also like to thank, uh, to thank Professor Anton Juan, um, the co-host of this event, and of course, Professor Michelle Hox uh, and all the staff at the U Institute for inviting me and for giving me this opportunity to present my uh, research. I will uh, now um, share my screen to um, present um, my topic of today, which is um, 
transnational Chinese theaters and uh, people theaters networks. So this um, talk is um, based on, um, oops, sorry, is based on a book, which uh, as Professor Chan has um, mentioned just now, was published uh, last year. So it was actually published just before the pandemic started. And, um, and I always say that it is somehow, somehow ironic that a book that discusses the idea of transnationalism, the idea of traveling, the idea of journey will be published just when we actually stop doing all of these um, activities. And, uh, and therefore I cherish even more the opportunity to discuss aspects of this book here today um, um, in, this, in this forum. Um, so what is uh, transnational Chinese or Asian theaters? Um, as I uh, define it in the book, uh, this concept um, denotes a practice of intercultural collaboration that is uh, characterized by being a network practice. So it, it is built upon networks of uh, artists and practitioners and uh, secondly, of being located in Asia. So it is a, a type of um, intercultural theater collaboration that takes Asia as its uh, focus. And as such, it is also can also be understood as a method of theatrical production and uh, a theory in the sense that it can be used as a, as a concept to understand and conceptualize these um, practices. And um, also um, a characteristic of, uh, of transnational Chinese theaters, as I define it, is its relational quality. Um, relational quality that um, tends to connect um, performance cultures and performance communities in, um, in the Chinese speaking region, as well as to um, other communities in the wider East Asian region. And that is why I placed, uh, I bracketed Asian in the sense that uh, originally the, the concept was conceived um, as a purely uh, foc as purely focusing on the sinosphere, on the contemporary sinosphere, so in the Chinese speaking region. But then actually, as I explored case studies, including the ones um, that I'm going to present today, um, I realized how um, the East Asian and the inter-Asian connection was uh, very uh, prominent and significant. And therefore, um, um, is, and this is the reason why this Asian is bracketed there. So the idea of transnational Chinese or transnational Asian, uh, the, uh, these two ideas are supposed to be complementary and one somehow expanding the other um, because um, the ultimate purpose or, or aspiration, let's say, of this concept is to rethink not only the situation of theatrical collaboration and performance networking in East Asia, but to provide a model to rethink um, intercultural performance theory from the perspective, in, in my case, a specific case of inter-Chinese or inter-Asian networks, but potentially also other types of networks in Asia or between Asia and other um, regions um, of the world that are not necessarily Western centered, and I will come back to this point later. Also, um, in case um, you are uh, interested in watching uh, some examples of these practices, um, particularly those explored in the book, I also created a playlist on, on YouTube which has um, the same name as the, the book. Um, so some uh, theoretical points, uh, not many, uh, but just to, um, to provide a framework, you know, for, for this concept. One uh, important idea um, is the idea, obviously, of transnationalism and particularly the definition of transnationalism as minor, uh, which is proposed by Francois Lien and Schumann in, uh, in their book, Minor Transnationalism. And minor transnationalism is useful um, and relevant to the concept of transnational Chinese theaters, TCTs uh, here means transnational Chinese theaters, uh, because um, both concepts emphasize um, informal, so infranational uh, networks, so networks that do not rely on nation to nation or state to state relationship, but are. Um, mostly practitioners led or initiated by practitioners and artists. 
And several of the cases that I examine in the book are, um, are non-governmental and people-based uh, collaborations, um, and uh, including the networks of um, Asian people's theater practitioners that I will um, discuss um, later. And also uh, the, uh, an important point here is the idea of horizontal or lateral relations. So relations that um, go beyond, if not necessarily oppose or exclude uh, nation-based uh, frameworks. And that's the idea of, of transnational, uh, which is the concept that does not eliminate the nation from the equation, as we will see from the examples, national politics is still very much there, but tries to transcend the boundaries, the limits, particularly the limitations of the, of the national through the dimension of the transnational. And, and therefore, uh, rather than foregrounding nations or nation states, uh, transnational Chinese theaters foreground uh, connections between places or regions or cities. Uh, and, and in particular, this idea of the city as a methodology or as a framework to understand uh, collaboration in Asia is explored uh, further in this forthcoming book, um, which uh, Professor Chong has mentioned just now, Asian City Crossing, which is the edited volume, um, which I co-edited with uh, Dr. Ashley Thorpe and uh, focuses on Hong Kong and Singapore as nodal points of city to city performing arts connections in Asia. And it is um, a collection of essays by both um, scholars and also practitioners from the two cities. Another, um, another um, concept which uh, is uh, central to the um, work I try to do in, in this book is the idea of Asia as method, uh, which was proposed by uh, Chen Quanxing uh, in this um, book, Asia as method toward the imperialization. Um, and Chen Quanxing actually elaborates this notion of Asia's method from the theories of Takeuchi Yoshimi, who already in 1960, published, um, gave a lecture, and which is now published and translated also in, into English, called Asia as Method. Um, and Chen Quanxing defined, a, defines Asia and takes Asia not only as a geopolitical or geolinguistic entity, but as what he terms as a structure of sentiment or an anchoring point um, uh, to forge um, connections. Uh, in that sense, anchoring point. And also Asia uh, is taken as a, as an epistemological site, as a site of um, knowledge production. And I put uh, Chen Quanxing here. Um, so Asia refers to an open-ended imaginary space, a horizon through which links can be made and new possibilities can be articulated. As an attempt to move beyond existing limit and as a gesture towards something more productive, my notion of method does not imply an instrumentalist approach, but is imagined as a mediating process. And this idea of mediation, and uh, in, in the case of today's examples, also um, mediation in the sense of reconciliation is quite crucial to several of the examples that I look at here. And the aim um, of Asia's method for Chen Quanxing is to uh, shift points of reference towards Asia in the sense that um, instead of always centering our discourses on, on, on the West uh, as method, as he calls it, we can refocus our inquiries taking Asia as a center. And this is why he talks about uh, a tripartite process of decolonization, de-imperialization, and the Cold War, which I believe it's his neologism, of what of epistemologies of ways in which we understand Asia and how and, and also how Asia understands itself and defines itself uh, of social processes and also structures of feeling within Asia, including feelings uh, often tense between different regions and different nations within Asia. And also in my own particular case, uh, the um, idea of exploring Asia's method is also an attempt to decolonize and de-imperialize the idea of um, interculturalism. 
by, as, as I explained earlier, try to refocus the idea of the interculture um, on Asia. Uh, finally, um, another um, important uh, um, or central um, concept in, in my study is the idea of significant chronotopes. Uh, the idea of chronotopes is obviously uh, not my own <clears throat> term, but comes from um, Michael Bachtin's idea uh, of theory of the chronotope in literature. And in, in the, the way I use it here uh, is to denote a significant uh, time spaces or sites of collective memory in East Asia, which are inter-referenced cross, or cross-referenced and are collectively and jointly um, problematized and commemorated through the intercultural collab co collaboration. Um, so basically, um, what interested me when I selected these case studies and I decided to organize the book according to these significant chronotopes is what happened when a, a particular event, especially a traumatic historical event, is uh, remembered and is worked through um, performatively by uh, a group of collaborators uh, coming from different places, not only from necessarily from the place where this event occurred. And also, of course, there are events in the history of East Asia that um, are shared, for example, uh, the memories of the Pacific War um, and the struggles for democracy uh, across, across the, the region, among others. And so uh, a lot of these works, in fact, although they take a transnational perspective on, on the notion of memory, in fact, they, they thematize what Michael Berry in his book, uh, History of Pain, Cause centrifugal and centripetal trauma. So basically, they, uh, the transnational collaboration gives artists uh, and op an audiences indeed an opportunity to uh, memorialize contentious national histories in a transnational um, setting or, or on a transnational platform. And also, uh, um, several of these works, um, um, while trying to create this cross. Asian relational memory by remembering uh, themes and events that are uh, common or shared between the collaborators. They also, at the same time, emphasize uh, uh, events uh, within the nation. And this uh, will become clear, hopefully, when, once I move on to the examples. And again, here, uh, the idea is interreferencing in cross-comparison -com relations. Um, and therefore, uh, the idea of inter-Asian referencing, as proposed by uh, uh, Chobang Fad and Iwa Butikoichi, among others, uh, is relevant here in, in, in the sense um, for the purpose of, of inter-referencing memories. Um, and one example here um, is uh, the, um, this uh, series of two performances uh, 30th parallel in Silk Play and 30th parallel in Taipei that was produced in 2005 and performed in South Korea, um, Taiwan, and mainland China. And, and this um, was created by a network of um, so-called people's, people's theatre practitioners from um, Taipei, Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai, the Shanghai group was actually the initiator of the project uh, um, on the invitation of um, practitioners from South Korea. And also uh, the, the first production features um, two South Korean performers. Mm. And, and this production, the 30th parallel still play, so the first of the, of the two, also marked the establishment of uh, the so-called East Asia People's Theatre Network. Um, and the East Asia People's Theatre Network uh, included, at the time, members from South Korea, uh, from the South Korean People's Theatre Association, which has a long history in the country, from Japan, uh, particularly a practitioner of tent theatre, Daito Sakurai, who works also um, um, in Taiwan and more recently has worked in mainland China as well. From China, um, Grass Stage, the company that initiated the project, which I will introduce later. Uh, from Taiwan, um, 
Um, and the Taiwanese People's Theatre also has a long, relatively long history, longer than in mainland China. And the same applies to Hong Kong. And, and the Hong Kong partners um, of the network um, where the so-called Asian um, Hong Kong Asian People's Theatre Festival Society, led by Augustine or Mok or Mok Chiu Yu, who is a veteran um, artist and activist um, in this type of socially engaged theatre. Um, and they describe themselves as practitioners of people theatre, um, but their practices um, are quite diverse. So uh, some of them have um, been involved in political activism as well. Um, in, uh, and, and generally, they all um, work within uh, the category, the broad category of social theatre or, or theatre for social justice, which includes a range of methods, uh, including applied theatre, playback for um, works uh, within the local communities of their respective countries, theatre and education, and so forth. And generally, um, the inspirations that these groups um, often bring up are the theatre of the oppressed, um, the method um, pioneered by Augusto Boal in Brazil, in the US, the Bread and Puppet Theatre and the San Francisco Mime Troupe, and in the Philippines, particularly um, this group, the Philippines Educational Theatre Association is, um, was a key reference to, to start uh, practices of so-called people's theatre in East Asia, as well as the Black Tent Theatre, Kuro Tento, um, um, founded in Japan by Kotomakoto and others in the late 60s. And the group, the, the network actually um, formally, the, was, it was never really a formal network, but let's say that uh, after a number of collaborations, some members uh, moved on to other uh, experiences, including uh, Grass Stage, um, uh, the, the, the Shanghai group that started this uh, collaboration. But uh, other members have uh, continued working. And for example, last year, they have uh, held uh, uh, East Asian People's Theatre Festival online for um, due to the pandemic, of course, which was uh, live streamed from part, so live stream from, from Seoul, and then um, other performers joined in from Thailand, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and it's um, parts of it are on YouTube if you are interested in looking some or examples. And yes, Grass Stage. Uh, Grass Stage, as I mentioned, was the initiator of this um, of this um, network, and uh, it's a group that was established in 2005 in Shanghai, and it is still active, although no longer uh, working in in with these um, collaborators, not very often anymore. Um, it's independent, and which in China means that it does it, it does not depend on the network of uh, state-run theaters, which is still the prominent um, organization um, structure in, in mainland China. It's largely composed of non-professionals and they define themselves as, um, a, uh, as providing a third way or third path in, in the theater in China, meaning that they work outside and beyond the state system. And also they are not affiliated with any profit oriented organization. And therefore they often describe this, that the, the work uh, as a social praxis uh, rather than art or a, 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 an aesthetic pursuit. Um, and they emphasize particularly the work they do, including training work with uh, non-professionals, uh, the common people, as um, they have described their, their, the participants in their projects. And coming to the uh, project uh, 30 Parallel Still Play, um, the, the project explores the contemporary legacies of um, the Cold War in East Asia. And uh, it tries to interreference the situation of division left behind by the Cold War in South Korea, in, in, on the Korean Peninsula, so the division between uh, so, uh, South and North Korea, and the China Taiwan cross strait system, as Chen Kuan has called it, basically the the crisis, the diplomatic crisis that started, um, um, that defined China Taiwanese relations since uh, the Cold War. And particularly, um, 
in in the, the the chapter in the analysis of of this work, I was uh, inspired by uh, the South Korean uh, author uh, theorist uh, Park Nam Chung, who has theorized extensively this idea of the overcoming the division system, and he sees this. A division system, not only a matter of geopolitical territorial borders, but uh, uh, an effective regime somehow, uh, which self reproduces itself and has been doing so since um, the the aftermath of the of the Korean War. And on the other hand, you know, this is a transnational, let's say, the, the transregional uh, comparative context of the production, and the national uh, element is that at the same time as it tries to to negotiate uh, the politics of the post-Cold War legacies, it also tries to, mem to commemorate uh, democracy movements, social movements uh, in Korea, uh, Taiwan, and China. So here, the significant chronotopes are several. So uh, one is Beijing Taipei 1945, basically uh, the origin of the China-Taiwanese cross-strike crisis after the Second World War. Uh, and following the, the the civil war in China, when um, the Kuomintang government then established itself in Taiwan, and China was uh, the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949 by Mao um, Zedong. And um, the second is uh, Panmunjom 1953, which is the site of the Korean Armistice Disagreement after the Korean War, which sanctioned the division of the two Koreas. And on the other hand, in terms of commemoration of democracy movements, um, there is one particular movement, uh, South Korean democracy movement, the Gwangju uh, democratization movement, which is commemorated, but also indirectly, and especially in the second installment of, of the series, two uh, movements in Taiwan, namely the 228 or February 28 uh, movement in of 1947 incident and the Tiananmen Square um, um, student demonstrations and crackdown of June 4th, uh, 1989. And um, the, the, the play was performed um, in this festival, the Asian Madang People Pieces Festival in South Korea in Guangzhou. So it was a festival organized to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the, the of, <clears throat> sorry of the Guangzhou democratization movement, and um, it was held in in a park that um, commemorates uh, this this event. And it was and was performed in a tent, as you can see. It was performed in in this uh, setting. And here I have some images of the um, of the opening ceremony, just to show you you know, the arrangement of, of the space and audiences and performance. And um, also um, the Guangzhou democratization movement, I'm, I'm not going to talk extensively about this, but just in a couple of words, it was um, a major uh, struggle for democracy that took place uh, in 1980 and which basically led to then uh, seven years later, the first democratic elections in South Korea. And that's when also the, the movement was renamed uh, from uprising as it was labeled um, at the time of the event into a, a legitimate movement, struggle for democracy. And if you're interested, there's a, a, a nice uh, film called A Taxi Driver st uh, starring the lead actor of Parasite, the South Korean film which you probably may, may have seen which gives you a context to, to this movement, um, just for reference. And here I have more um, images of the festival uh, where you can see the type of theater that was um, performed there to commemorate the, the events of, uh, of the Guangzhou um, democratization movement. Um, and some other photos from the Hong Kong and Taiwanese participants um, also dealing with issues of social justice. Um, the, the context of my red dress uh, was uh, Cambodia. Um, so the, uh, the Khmer Rouge <clears throat> Pol Pot and the, 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 the second, um, the silent wave by the assignment theater from Taipei 
was talking about uh, the Pacific War and its aftermath. So they were all focusing on uh, questions of, of, of redress uh, um, of justice or um, traumatic events um, in the region. And this is uh, uh, the opening of 30 Parallel Still Play, which opens with a video. So the production is uh, a physical theater production, mostly, mostly non-verbal, um, with uh, multimedia elements. Uh, so video um, footage, uh, historical footage, and also videos produced specifically for the production. And uh, the, the opening video is interesting and, and relevant to thematize this idea of the division system because it shows um, a children's game um, in which two children basically draw, first draw with a pencil and then cut through with uh, a knife, uh, a, a division line across their school desk. Um, and, and in this way, uh, the production basically introduces um, the genesis, if, uh, so to speak, of, of the division system uh, by showing how um, the process of socialization and education are informed by this idea of division uh, from the very early stages of life and also the idea of tracing the division with pencil first and then with a knife shows how the division was supposed to be temporary in South Korea. And also if we think of the China-Taiwan example, you know, there was this idea that uh, the mainland would be um, recovered, but then this never happened and it became a perpetual state. Um, I have some videos here, but I'm also aware of time. Uh, so I think I will not play them because um, unless maybe there is time later, but you can find all of these videos on in the transnational Chinese theater, the playlist on YouTube that I mentioned earlier. Um, and um, what is interesting here is that whereas the first video uh, shows clearly, uh, you know, this process of division, also uh, in terms of colors, you know, by color coding the arms of the children, uh, red and white. Uh, the ensemble um, that performs this piece is a collective body, as Zhao Tuan, uh, one of the creators, has described it, that, um, and a neutral body. They all work back um, to, to create this idea of um, neutrality. And also, interestingly, uh, Zhao Tuan has described this piece not exactly as a work of art, but as an incident. Um, which carries out a discussion, a physical discussion or discussion through the body. And as I mentioned, there is very little, there are very little spoken, uh, few spoken parts in this production, which also uh, led itself well to, to the international um, setting of the of this uh, of the premiere of this work. And um, I have a few other slides with images uh, to show how this division is uh, visualized through media. So here is the historical footage of US soldiers uh, unfolding a flag across um, the 30th parallel at the end of the war. And also in the theater, the, the, um, they use sellotape to, to Trace a line on the on the ground, and then throughout um, the performance in several scenes, you had two uh, groups of performance uh, um, symbolizing you know the two um, opponents or the two um, political uh, entities. And uh, also, apart from political issues, uh, there are also scenes, for example, in which uh, Taiwan's Sino-Taiwanese diplomatic talks are reenacted. So there is the, the institutional dimension, but there is also a lot uh, on the human dimension, on the human cost of the division. For example, in this scene in which they show uh, this couple um, trying to, to join their, their bodies and failing to do that and trying to cross the line and, and being pushed back. And so um, in, in this part of the, of the of the paper, of the chapter in, in my book in which I talk about this production, I try to think of the border as an as a ambiguous space 
or non or non play of of both resistance and compliance because the movement suggests that the actors constantly try to push back and to join and push back not only not only in this and are pushed back not only in this thing. Uh, also games are very important and there's uh, there are several scenes in which um, uh, war games or scenes of institutional violence are simulated, uh, expressing this idea of choreo policing suggest, uh, proposed by Andre Lepetsky. So the idea that uh, the performance, performance and act movements that suggest uh, an attempt to abort any political, um, any any attempt to express uh, a political statement through through the bodies. For example, there are other scenes in which again they are they are pushed to the floor they are uh, they scream or they vocalize their their resistance but they are silenced um so there are several um actions of of, of this kind and in other scenes uh, instead of games or physical um actions that suggest um games they actually use actual toys to to show, um, you know, this idea of conflict across the um, division line. And um, also interesting is in terms of the evocation of military brutality is the way they use uh, stuffed clothes or clothes stuffed with newspapers to to try and show uh, to show um, the institutional violence, the brutality that took place both in the um, war scenario and in the uh, struggle for democracy in South Korea. And, um, and as I mentioned earlier, although um, the other movements in Taiwan and China were not um, ex uh, mentioned explicitly in this production, they are in the second one. Um, there was uh, an underlying sense of of, of shared uh, commemoration in the sense that um, these things could apply to the context of um, where all the participants um, came from. And it's also interesting, in fact, I didn't say that earlier that the film Taxi Driver is actually, was actually never shown in China, uh, apparently because uh, it's too close, um, the scenes that it depicts are too close to scenes uh, of the June 4th events in Beijing. And uh, and here the visual co the commemoration of the victims is carried out through visual means. So we have projections of portraits, uh, photographs. Through, uh, so basically, there is um, a consistent use of intermediality in the production as a device of evocative device to evoke the memory and also to fix the memory. And in this sense, they create this uh, relational memory because. Um, the participants related to these images differently um, and brought their own national experiences to the transnational um, um, collaboration somehow. Uh, and finally, um, it's interesting to, to, in conclusion, to talk uh, about the final scene, which ends with um, ambiguity. So this this theater, this work, and the next installment, and other works that this uh, network has created, they do not um, have obviously the ambition to provide any solution or any conclusion to uh, the problems that they raise. But the idea is to um, raise awareness and to start a discussion. And in this particular performance, it's interesting that at the end, when the um, actors start rejoicing after having announced the reunification, interestingly, of the Koreas um, and the unification of China and Taiwan, somebody comes in, uh, a performer called the Indifferent Man, and throws a bucket of ice cold water against them. Um, so this, this, um, the effect machina somehow is used as a distancing device, like to, to wake up um, audiences and actors to reality. And uh, Zhao Tuan, when I asked him about this scene, Zhao Tuan being one of the creators of the piece, said uh, that I wanted to show that although the play is called, play, the, the work is called uh, Parallel 30 Parallel in Play, Yoshi in Chinese. This is not a Yoshi, this is not a game, but it's actually a current reality 
uh, and a legacy of the Cold War, which still lives, in fact, and has to be taken um, seriously. Um, yes, I think it's time for me to close. So um, basically, um, you know, this um, performances are um, important, I believe, because they show um, this attempt to uh, reconcile certain um, processes of conflict and certain conflictual memories through uh, the arts and through informal networks, which I said, they do not have the ambition of solving anything, but if but they try to bring these issues to the fore and to remind um, audiences that these issues happen and they are still um, are not fully resolved. And in this sense, um, I see in this context, I see, you know, this grassroots uh, network of people theater as attempts to um, create um, a transgressive imagination of the nation. And this concept from Peter Hitchcock and the capital N is intentional, is basically to show how this, this project try to exceed the limits of na the nation and of national identity, and also to exceed the limits within which the nations of East Asia commemorate um, these events. And, and therefore, uh, they are examples of the process of the Cold War in that Chen Kuan-Xing discusses in that they shift the, not only theatrical production, but also the production of memory work from the narrow national or even nationalistic um, framework to uh, a transnational or historical framework um, in which the arts play uh, an important um, mediating and role of, of, um, of reconciliation and aspiration to um, increasing awareness of these um, processes. And I think I will stop here now because I think I have spoken um, enough. I used up my time. So I will stop sharing. Thank you very much for that uh, fascinating talk. I've read the book and I still feel like I learned new things from the presentation and it's wonderful to see the images as well. Um, we would like to now begin the moderated discussion portion of this talk. So we invite all the audience members to please feel free to contribute questions using the Q&A tool and we will read those aloud. Um, and meanwhile, Professor Juan and I will also get the discussion started with a few questions of our own. Um, Anton, would you like to begin? Yes, I would like to begin. And I would like to, uh, first of all, congratulate Professor Ferrari for that wonderful lecture in so compact, but still so succinct and, and inclusive of, of the uh, multinational traditions of theater and, and um, its connection to memorialization. And um, I'd like to ask a specific question. Um, in the process of memorialization of, uh, of events and um, what we call, uh, what you call the chron chronotopes within, within the nations themselves, amongst the nations, these, do these parallel memorializations encounter, for instance, um, a resistance from governments uh, and therefore censorships of, of, of these works. And what is the effect on the, on the theater companies that are joining together in, this, um, in these works? Thank you, uh, Professor Juan, for this question. Yeah, this is very important, uh, very important I mentioned because as I mentioned, uh, the fact that these works operate on a transnational level does not obviously exclude the the realm of the national and national uh, politics. Uh, and, um, and that is why um, uh, uh, the, particularly for uh, partitions for mainland China, I think it has been somehow productive and even liberating to go and produce this work uh, in South Korea or in other cases in, in Hong Kong and uh, Hong Kong a few years ago, not quite now, and Singapore as uh, Freer spaces where they could express certain um, ideas that perhaps in, in, in mainland China would not be uh, would not go through past the 
the monitoring process. For example, this production was actually performed uh, in, in, in Shanghai a few times, but um, it was not publicized. So the also I think I, I could only find one review. It was absolutely under the radar. Um, and also interestingly, it was performed in a space which is not a theater, but used to be a, a sort of a creative space uh, slash rehearsal uh, uh, where it was an old warehouse. And in those situations, uh, they, um, they don't sell tickets, they go by donations. And in that sense, they can bypass the, the monitoring process. Yeah, but that is about the specific um, circumstances of growth stage. Other examples I look at in the, in the book, uh, for example, there is a production, uh, a Sino-Chinese Sino uh, Singaporean production about the Second World War. Um, which is an adaptation of a play by a playwright from Singapore called Ko Pao Kun. Uh, and that one uh, had an interesting story because both uh, China and Japan tried to perform it, but they never succeeded because of the sensitive content. So definitely there is this dimension, yeah. Um, I think, do we have questions from other people who would like to get? Not yet, but I'm going to speak directly to all of my students out there and ask you all to uh, please contribute some <laughs> questions through the Q&A tool. Um, you know, I think that I wanted to ask one question, which was related to that, you know, sort of on the flip side of censorship in terms of the impact that these productions have, you know, who are they speaking to? And if the goal is, you know, to not so much to make a strong change, but rather to make a political intervention by drawing awareness to the shared traumas and memories and parallel histories in new ways. Um, what, what do we see in terms of how that is affecting audiences or even other theatrical productions in these areas? What's their, their sort of reach and influence? Yeah, I don't think um, in the case of, of, of this production, I don't think uh, the reach um, in China or um, in Taiwan was particularly significant because of the reason I just uh, reasons mm -hmm. I just explained. Uh, but uh, in South Korea, uh, where the debate is more open, uh, apparently it then triggered other. Um, it, uh, first of all, it triggered quite uh, strong audience reactions. Apparently, when it was premiered in in Guangzhou. And, uh, and then it also triggered more dialogues and more collaborations between these artists as a result of this um, also aimed at exploring other controversial, let's say, issues, not necessarily regarding memory or national atrocity, but also um, issues of um, exploitation of labor uh, or social justice, war zones, um, child labor, um, women's issues or minority issues as well. For example, there is an Aboriginal group from Taiwan that at some point participate in this network. Um, but generally they don't have, they haven't had um, huge you know, audiences and particularly uh, non, not really like commercial, you know, like paying audiences um, in the traditional sense. In Taipei, it was performed at the Wuling Theater. Um, so that was, <clears throat> I believe, uh, a more traditional theatrical setting. But in this case, it was more a uh, sharing process rather than, you know, performing for an audience. Yeah. Thanks. We have another question from the audience. Is there one? Why don't you, Anton, would you like to follow up? Well, then I wanted to, I just wanted to uh, ask uh, Professor Ferrari, uh, what is her take on the de urbanization of theater and how is this uh, uh, moving forward when it comes with, with the, the idea of a transnational uh, uh, collective movement across Asia, where, where theaters are no longer uh, centered in, in cities, but you know, in the different regions of, of a, a nation. Is there a, a kind of a effect of the urbanization of theater on, on this uh, collective movement of memorialization? 
I didn't really look into urbanization as such, but I looked into cities as um, enabling spaces. So particularly cities like, um, as I mentioned earlier, Hong Kong and Singapore, which are both cities and states, and how those two identities can be negotiated or used uh, to the practitioner's advantage. And actually, if, if I think of urbanization, um, projects like these have actually done, uh, had a positive effect, I think, in taking the theater outside the cities. So, because uh, often these projects, you know, they're classified as, you know, avant-garde uh, that serve a very small community of artists or audiences in a city, for example, in Shanghai or in Seoul. Uh, whereas in, in this case, these groups have actually worked um, with um, rural community or, or more community in smaller cities. For example, um, Grass Stage uh, have, has done a project uh, subsequently in which they took um, their works uh, in the countryside and tried to provoke debates there about issues of social justice, um, or particularly the uh, social inequality in China uh, among mm, common audiences, not the usual suspects that go to the theater in, in the big cities. So I think there, there is uh, some something to say about the urbanization uh, or the de-urbanization, in fact, that this project may figure, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. We have a question from Professor Michelle Hawks, uh, who I think is asking one of the big questions related to this genre of work. Um, he asks, how do recent developments, especially in Hong Kong, affect the type of transnational collaborations that you've described? And can we still conceive of these developments in the context of Chen Guangxin's framework, given the recent developments? Uh, yes, that's that's a very interesting question that obviously, um, I have a chapter on Hong Kong in this book. Um, which talks mostly, focuses mostly on the pre and post 1997, so on the 1997 question. Um, but the, the second book uh, that somehow derived from, from, from this project, The Asian City Crossings, uh, was started um, before the protests um, and before, uh, and, and we basically closed it and submitted around the time where the national security law was uh, issued and we had a lot of, um, we had some decisions to, we had to take some decisions about, you know, um, exposing uh, certain contributors, for example, from Hong Kong um, to some of them, for example, wrote, write directly about the national security law, they write directly about the, the umbrella movement, the protests, uh, and we, we had this uh, feeling that perhaps this uh, Asia's method, uh, you know, co co community was no longer as safe as it was when, when, when we started the project. So now there are much more, uh, many more complex um, issues of, of also safeguarding of, of, of the artists involved, uh, apart from us, you know, scholars who invite artists to write, but also within the production community, which is what I think Michelle is asking about, um, uh, as I said, uh, the idea was that Hong Kong and Singapore were spaces where things could happen more easily uh, than, than in, in Taiwan or in Hong Kong. You know, Hong Kong and Singapore were the places where uh, uh, Sino-Taiwanese collaborations occurred for the first time in history, where Sino-Taiwanese dialogues, direct dialogues happened in the 1980s. But now uh, things, I think, uh, are going to probably be um, affected, yeah, um, be different. And this is why also I mentioned the irony of this project because, um, you know, with the pandemic and this, this new laws uh, coming into effect uh, in Hong Kong, particularly uh, the future of transnational Chinese theaters is not the one I had envisioned, yeah. It's transnational Chinese Zoom theater now. And uh, so, self-regulated. <laughs> yeah, um, which I don't know. I mean, I it's not a positive development, but I think maybe the, there'll be another cycle of these parallels developing though, because in periods of repression, then it's another opportunity eventually to connect those traumas and histories. But in the moment, I, 
it's incredibly vulnerable and dangerous for a lot of these, these artists. Um, we have another question from the audience uh, asking, to what extent is the East Asian diaspora in Europe and America engaged in any of these collaborations? Ah, yes, thanks. That's an interesting question. Um, there are, um, I have one example in, in transnational Chinese theaters, the, the, in the Hong Kong chapter, let's say, the one surrounding Hong Kong 1997 where uh, the uh, American uh, diaspora in the US and in Canada is brought in. Oh, and also uh, Japanese Americans. Uh, one, one choreographer from New York was also a participant. So there are also um, questions of uh, identity uh, discussed in relation not only to Hong Kong, but also in relation to to the Chinese uh, transnational communities and also to the um, diasporic effects that 1997 created, you know, when especially after Tiananmen Square, uh, when many, uh, several, uh, a significant portion of Hong Kong citizens uh, sought um, to try to relocate. Uh, and also, uh, particularly um, the, the North American examples deal, yes, with, with questions of, of, of identity. Um, in uh, the Singaporean uh, case, also there has been uh, there have been connections with uh, the British Singaporean community, uh, and so there, there are some some examples there, um, also addressing questions of identity. Um, you know, and race and inclusion rather than um, this, this politics of memory that I discussed today, yeah. Could I ask a sort of a follow-up question that I think will be relevant to my students? So the, the class that's attending today is a world theaters class and we talk a lot about you know, specifically the way in which contemporary theater artists self-reflexively engage with their theatrical traditions. And I know that's not as much a part of what's going on with 38th Parallel Play necessarily, but I know you've done a lot of work on this in general. And so I'm curious to what extent you see that sort of, um, you know, the, the Chichu 2.0 or other ways of engaging with the national theatrical tradition also playing into these transnational networks and collaborations. Oh yes, thank you. Yeah, that's, that is um, another significant part of, of, of this uh, Asia's method or Asian theater's method um, framework. So the, uh, the focus of not only on works that happen in Asia, but also that somehow rely on, on the Asian performance heritage to, to, to say something about, about the present. And uh, um, in this case, not in the 30th parallel, but there were um, other works in, in the festival, South Korean uh, works that actually engage local traditions like um, shamanic. Uh, performances of Korea with dance um, specifically. Uh, in, in my research, I've used mostly the example of Kung Fu and no theater uh, used um, um, both in terms of actors performing, but also uh, the recycling and, and rewriting of text to um, talk about present um, conditions. For example, in, in the performance, I, the collaboration I mentioned earlier, the Spirits play about the uh, Second World War um, in Singapore and in China, they, uh, the cast was uh, composed by actors, uh, co contemporary dancers and theater actors, but also uh, actors from Kung Fu, Kung Opera um, and no theater, Japanese no theater. Um, to commemorate this, um, the, the wartime atrocities in, in the two places. And also in connection with the idea of reconciliation, the fact that they invited particularly, specifically Japanese actors and actors from Nanjing, from, from, from Nanjing, which is the site of uh, the infamous Nanjing massacre of 1937, to collaborate on a project on the war Obviously, it was not accidental. It was an attempt to try again, not to surely to solve uh, an unsolvable, probably issue, but to to bring attention 
and to try to create some bridges, at least for the in maintain at the, the non-governmental informal level of the uh, of the arts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm remembering being in Nanjing in 2010. 2010 was that when one of the exchanges happened? I can't even remember now. Um, but I think you know that 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 person to person connection, even just on the level of the individual actors having that exchange and then incorporating that deeper awareness into their own work is a really significant intervention. Um, we have another question from the audience that is in a similar vein, I think, um, that may be a little bit more fine grained asking, to what extent do distinct regional performance styles, so like Quinchu that you mentioned, um, interact in transnational theatrical movements that connect theater makers from different backgrounds and also do any specific East Asian styles dominate or are the contemporary movements you've written about, do they combine styles or incorporate more Western performance? Yes, thanks. Um, well, Western performance, I suppose, um, yes, th there is a discussion to be had on, on Western performance style as a sort of universal language, uh, including the use of English in the rehearsal room, which is, um, Again, a not, not a neutral point, and it's somehow paradoxical, and it's clearly a legacy of, of colonialism and cultural imperialism in East Asia. You know, uh, the fact that the um, artists from Korea, Japan, China, the Philippines, um, Thailand, they meet, and to produce a work, they 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 have to speak in English, and and physically, often they they. Um, they use uh, improvisation methods or workshop methods um, that um, are Western. Again, I don't know if the theater of the oppressed can be described as Western, but surely, um, you know, for example, in, in the performances of, of um, Danny Young with Sunni Akazahedron, you know, the, the style is the postmodernist style of multimedia theater that we have seen. Um, that now has become a universal language. But the, it's also, as uh, you mentioned, Tarin, an opportunity for the actors to exchange um, on a physical level, uh, some sort of physical memory, and also to exchange or to barter, like um, uh, who is that? Eugenia Barba used to say, you know, to barter uh, physical uh, methods to, to physical heritages of, of performance. So for example, in Nanjing, you may have seen that yourself, how the no theater actors were interacting with the country actors and they were trying to exchange uh, physical vocabularies and find uh, common points to which they could express certain things. And also in the spirit play, for example, the no uh, the kun actors created no masks, which are obviously not the orthodox ones, but they uh, somehow reminiscent and then they use them. Uh, to evoke this idea of the spirit and of the ghost on the, in the piece, which um, which connects um, uh, with the the, the the repertoire of no theater, you know, as a theater that often uh, brings ghosts back to the story, usually a story of somebody being wronged and seeking revenge. In my uh, re, um, case studies, no uh, and Kunsu. Mm, Beijing opera uh, sometimes um, are most, uh, puppet theater has, I've also uh, uh, looked into briefly, they are most dominant, but I know, for example, that there have been also several of these experiments involved in Kabuki, which I haven't researched, but uh, I know they, they have some examples, yeah. I think they, sorry, just to, to I think actually the, 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 the idea is to explore the, those genres that have been classified as uh, intangible cultural heritage by UNESCO. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Anton, I'm wondering if you might like to join in here and just in terms of like how some of the work you've done accords with some of what Dr. Ferrari is discussing um, or if you have any other questions from the perspective, I'm sort of thinking we might shift a little bit to thinking about what Dr. Ferrari has presented in relation to these questions that we're asking about theater for social justice, but also the way that that engages with these deeper pasts and these traditions like 
you in your work with Kabuki and invoking no and that sort of thing. So I thought I'd pass it back to you to see if you have any other follow-up questions you might like to ask. Well, it's just like a comment on, you know, the West to the Western performance. Actually, Western performance has thoroughly been modernized by Asian performance, by Asian style. It was actually the, uh, the, the Asian uh, uh, physicalization or the embodiment of thought uh, and word that precisely revolutionized Western performance. And in recent years, in fact, the movement, I think, don't you agree, Professor Ferrari, that a lot of Western performances um, have now been infusing, you know, Asian styles in their performance so that, so that it's now not just become transnational in terms of Asia, but also transnational in terms of the whole world. It's really Asian, Asian styles are now really conquering, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, methods of, of performance. Like let's, let's say in, in Medea, you have the uh, puppets as the children of Medea, you know, they're taken like say from either Bunraku or even mm -hmm. Indian puppet style of, uh, of puppets. And then the use of the fan, and fan language and interpretations of poetry. Um, I did, for instance, Sa uh, Salome of, uh, of Oscar Wilde in Kabuki style. And mm. then, yeah, and then the Richard III, you know, had a lot of, uh, of physicalization of the, uh, the murders influenced by, similar to what they did at the 38th parallel through the use of, um, of dolls you know to symbolize mm -hmm. to symbolize the uh the extrajudicial killings you know so the use of the use of that very very uh symbolic or presentational styles of theater rather than just the word and the text so i i feel that i feel that asia has also like uh decolonized <laughs> the Western performance from itself. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. There's a, there's a reverse colonization going on now in theater, yeah. In fact, the Metropolitan Theater, I think, did, uh, did Madama Butterfly using Kabuki, uh, I mean, uh, Bunraku puppets for, for, the, chi for the child of, of Madama Butterfly. Yes, well, that, that is also at the core of the debate on intercultural theater, right? This connection between uh, Asian forms and European theaters and how originally they were appropriated in a cosmetic almost or decorative way, you know, I take a fan from here and I take a mask from here and they were decontextualized and just used ornamentally. And that was the old uh, style in you know, orientalist approach, whereas now hopefully we see more also because of more opportunities of direct contact and you know possibility of actually studying those forms and living those forms. There is more, um, there are more complex uh, engagements and hopefully decolonized <laughs> engagement with those forms that we didn't see um, in, in the past. Uh, but there is also in the communities of artists that I've researched at the same time, there is also still uh, quite a lot, bit of uh, criticism directed towards, you know, these uh, intercultural experiments that are um, somehow dominated by a European or Western or um, a North American, let's say, um, partner. Although mm, you could also actually think about power hierarchies within Asia itself, right? Because it all depends um, on also what, where the funding comes from, for example, and who has the, the power in, uh, also within Asia, yeah. I'd like to ask Professor Ferrari a question. It's kind of a, uh, I don't know, what do you think of the problem with, that is happening now in, in, in the South China Sea? Do you think this would bring about a certain commonality among different parts of Asia uh, regarding this, uh, this problem that is happening now? Do you think that this would become a kind of a common, common trajectory? 
well, I would hope uh, to see some uh, intellectual engagement and hopefully artistic engagement with, with this, because hopefully, often, as I think we mentioned that, yes, Yutarin mentioned that, that when there is a, a problem or attention, then the arts tend to then engage it and somehow uh, try to, to release this tension or problematize the tension. So perhaps we will see something in uh, about that. I mean, it's, it's, it's unspeakable, I, I, would, I would say, yeah to see the artist engaging with that. Um, I'm, I'm more suspicious of, of um, state-sponsored projects engaging with any right. kind of political or political events because often the idea is to, to drive the, the narrative towards a certain specific direction that closes out other voice, you know, other possibilities, yeah. I was curious, um, you know, just to go back to what you were mentioning in terms of the artist's attitude towards some of the perhaps like globally better known intercultural theater experiments, which again, to gesture to my students in the audience, we have talked about a lot of these over the course of the semester. Um, so, you know, there's this, there does seem to be a tension between projects that reach for the broadest possible audience trying to sort of open up and make accessible and approach the intercultural, the transnational and that way. And some of what you've described which seem to be like hyper-local, almost transnational, but hyper-local projects in terms of the way that they're um, engaging with their audiences specifically. And so one of the things I'm curious about is do the artists that you study through this lens of transcultural Chinese theaters, but specifically the more grassroots um, networks, do they aspire to have this bigger reach or are they really, you know, are they trying to bridge that sort of hyper-local to global or are they rejecting also the broader reach that's implicit within some of these other intercultural projects? Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I know that, um, Grass Stage, for example, uh, after this project, which was the, their first project, they they continued uh, engaging with other networks, including one called Asia Meet Asia, which has traveled much more and and performed their works more extensively still within Asia. However, so Japan, uh, they also collaborated with India. And I think actually they're, they're not particularly interested in going transnational in the sense of international. So for example, performing in Europe or in, in North America or in Australia, whatever, um, the, uh, the center, you know, the traditional center of let's say festivals are. Uh, on the one hand, because I think they are really committed to these dialogues, uh, you know, this minor dialogues uh, in, especially with um, people from the global south, uh, I know that Zhao Tuan uh, of Grass Stage has been working in, in India a couple of times already and doing workshops there. So I think there is a genuine interest. And also on the other hand, I think um, there is also, um, there are also some bad experiences. Like there is, a, I can say this because there's a video which is public. For example, they tried to collaborate years ago uh, with a, a company in, based in the UK on this project, a World Factory, which was um, supposed to look at you know, the issue of China, the factory of the world, Foxconn, yeah. um, and um, issues of social justice relating to labor and labor movements. And it started as a cooperation, and then apparently um, the, the Chinese partners accused the British partners of just using their materials, but not actually wanted to collaborate with them. And then eventually there was a British production, there was a Chinese production, but it was not a collaboration. And, and, and the way he explains it in this, in, this, um, in this talk, which is, as I said, public, so it's not a secret, is that basically, even though, even though there is this whole ethos of, yeah, let's collaborate, let's do something together on social justice, then in fact, the production process replicates the social injustice and the, and, and the unequal power dynamics that we see also uh, socially. You know, China is a world factory of the, of the West and the Chinese theatre group provides materials to the West, which then stages the work in London, right? So I think that there's not so much, and Zuni as well, you know, Zuni Akazahidron, which is obviously much more international. I don't think they are particularly keen on, on collaborations with partners uh, from outside Asia. Yes, that, that, was, that is my, feeling also looking at the uh, production history. 
Yes. Maybe Thank it's you. the younger generations, because now we have, you know, as I said, hopefully more equal intercultural dynamics, more mobility. Yeah. The digital is also equalizing things uh, somehow. We have only about five minutes remaining. It's it's the end of the official class period. We're running to 12.30. So if anybody in the audience would like to ask a final question, um, now is your last chance. So please feel free to drop anything you would like to ask in the Q&A box. Um, Anton, do you have any final questions before we start to wrap up? No, I, I am I'm quite excited about the idea of uh, a kind of a touring company going. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at what, is there such a thing like a, a group that would go from one country to another, you know, and perform each other's uh, issues in their own country and find parallel, you know, parallels in, 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 in each other's contexts. And would that, uh, what do you think, Professor Ferrari, would that be a feasible, realistic thing to do, or given the idea of oppression, of the oppressive state, you know, that's happening now, that's really happening in Asia, all over Asia? What do you think? Well, there have been such um, tours. Uh, one example is this network, Asia Meet Asia, which I um, also discussed in the book, which I actually created a a uh, moving festival, a touring festival that was taking uh, individual productions and collaborative productions all, all over uh, East Asia and South Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, dealing with uh, issues of, um, of, social of social justice. And that went on for many years. I'm not sure about um, the future um, because of the change in political conditions, which may make um, this flow, um, you know, less um, fluid, you know, may obstruct this, this mobility. Uh, and the, uh, another example is uh, um, this practitioner I mentioned earlier, Mok Chu Yu, Augustin Mok from Hong Kong. He has been doing, um, also um, has been working on this People See at the festival, which um, work, uh, talk about, for example, issues of social uh, labor, uh, exploitation in India and in Hong Kong and of Indian work is in Hong Kong and performing across Asia. But uh, first of all, yes, the national security law um, that we mentioned earlier, uh, and again, the, the state uh, may pose a, um, um, an obstacle. And also in his particular case, he writes in, 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 in his chapter in this Asian City Crossings book, which I edited, uh, um, this transnational experience also created a lot of problems, uh, financial problems, and a lot of problems uh, of relationships between all these different um, cultures um, traveling together, uh, practitioners traveling together. Um, but it has been done, so it is feasible. Uh, we will have to see whether the informality of these processes can bypass the, the state um, restrictions. Um, as I said, in China, they have this method of performing on for profit to asking for donations instead of selling tickets, which is a, is a way of, do, of, of, of doing this thing. Yeah. Um, as long as it lasts. Well, and I think, I mean, I think that in and of itself is, you know, in addition to the way that you describe these sort of transnational flows and the the political focus of these artists and their work, I think it's really important counter to a lot of what we encounter within sort of quote unquote Western theater in terms of like our idea about fixed ticketing structures and who can access resources in order to do productions that move around in time and space. And so I think really refocusing on these minor to minor networks and what they're able to accomplish and unpack and create in terms of parallels is really significant. So thank you so much for your fantastic lecture and for answering all of our questions on that. Um, 
So I think it's about time for us to conclude. Uh, for everyone who's still with us, I did put the link to the playlist list that Dr. Ferrari mentioned in the chat if you'd like to check that, that out. I also highly recommend her work, um, Transnational Chinese Theaters, and her forthcoming book on Asian city crossings. Um, so as we conclude, a huge thank you again to the Leo Institute for their support of this talk and the broader project, and to Dr. Ferrari for a fantastic lecture and discussion. So thank you very much. Well, uh, to you and Professor John again, and Professor Hawkes, and everybody at the Leo Institute, it was my pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you.